How should we worship God? Love Him? Yes, but how do we love Him? There are many fine points to be considered here. The first is, love is centered in the heart. So we should concentrate on developing the energy in the heart. But then, where do you direct that energy? The Srimad Bhagavatam gives this technique. It says to think of the heart as a lotus and turn the petals of the lotus, of the lotus upward to the brain. So feel that this heart's energy and love is being directed <laughs> upward. Otherwise, if it goes outward, then it will go into maya, into delusion. It can go into emotions. We watched the movie, a group of us watched the movie of um, St. Joan of Arc last night. Very interesting. But she was emotional. And she was looking at those, those uh, branches as they were coming up to, the flames were coming up from the branches to consume her body. And she was horrified by that. If she was a true devotee, she would not be horrified. It is a good practice, in fact, to visualize yourself being subjected that ki to that kind of a test and say, could I take that and not be emotional? Be calm and turn it within. The, the, well, we'll go into this a little bit later, but every pain can be turned toward God. So don't let yourself, don't let your feelings of heart Go outward, they'll become restless then. I can't take that, I can't take that. Be calm. Take it inward. Turn it upward toward God. And this is why also all the chakras should be brought in. Lady Mahajai taught with Kriya, Navi Kriya. In that you put your chin down on the uh, chest and concentrate on the navel. They speak of navel worship. That's of course ridiculous. Why should you worship your navel? <laughs> or even contemplate your navel? But there's a reason for it. The navel chakra is the highest of the materialistic centers. And when you develop the magnetism in that navel chakra, uh, chakra, it draws the energy up from the lower chakras. And while you're doing Navi Kriya, put your mind at the point between the eyebrows so that it doesn't just become stuck here, but keeps on being directed. So with all our chakras, always they should be centered and directed toward the spiritual eye. The heart center, whatever energy you feel there, feel it going upward, don't let it go out into the emotions. Joan of Arc failed in that, in that movie, not in reality. By the way, a very good book on Joan of Arc, if you can believe it, is one by Mark Twain. He thought it was his best book, and he spent 10 years of research on it. It's a very inspiring book, so do, do read it if you get a chance. Her life is inspiring, but she did not recant, and she did not get emotional. She just, think of, think of such tests in your life. Think of the worst test you could imagine. That surely must be as bad as anything you can imagine, and turn it to God and say, yes, I know this is temporary, I can take anything, because everything I have belongs to you. So with your heart, try to feel that the energy of the heart is going upward toward the point between the eyebrows. If you want to love God, love Him with your whole being. The next center is the chakra of the, uh, opposite the throat, the Vishuddha chakra. And uh, think of that energy as expansive, which it is, and then direct all that expansion up to God. And the most important thing is the medulla. This is the negative center. This is the positive center of the same, same one. And if you can understand that this is where your ego is centered, Master said that the sperm and the ovum, when they meet to form the human body, unite at that point. And then they go out to the brain, down the spine, out into the nervous system and create the human body. And so it is that people who are proud tend to draw their head back because pride creates tension in the back of the head. And it's a simple fact 
that in every culture, the gesture for humility and respect is a bow. Why? Because a bow indicates it's a, a relaxation at the, in the medullary area. You relax yourself forward and give yourself to him. So when you, when you want to meditate here, people say, well, I, mean, I know this was my problem at the beginning. From where do I look here? It's hard to feel that I'm looking from here. Do I look downward from the brain? Do I look upward from the body? Uh, it just, I used to be puzzled by it. Well, the answer is, be, feel that your center is here in the medulla and look forward at the point between the eyebrows and be more and more absorbed in that. A worldly person, everything he does is directed outward from this center at the back of the hand. And a master or an enlightened person, everything he does is from this center. And somehow I could see that that was the case with master. How, I don't know. But I could tell that's where his energy was coming from. So the more you do this practice, you'll feel a gradual relaxation of the tension here and sort of a moving forward of your center until all of it becomes centered here. And when you feel the center here, then you feel everything is wonderful because you feel that everything is blissful. And so visualize God. I like the form of mother and I'll talk about the mother, but you may prefer God as father, as brother, as sister, as friend, it doesn't matter. I, I've said sometimes jokingly, you can visualize him as, as, as a sacred crocodile, if you like. But the trouble is, I don't think this image works perfectly with crocodiles. <laughs> but if you think of the mother, then don't just think of a mental uh, abstraction. Think that she's there. Visualize her. Visualize her in human form. And... Uh, just feel that she's talking to you, that when you're talking to her, you're really talking to her. Feel that she's there listening to you, communing with you. Always understand that in those eyes, as we had in this song, Dark Eyes, always understand that in those eyes is the consciousness of infinity. You have to go through that to become one with the infinite. You know, in the... Indian tradition, Kali, is an image of God. I think the images of God that they have in India are somehow intended to remind you of God and also not to make you too attracted to them. For instance, Jagannath, <laughs> Jagannath has his arms truncated because you can't confine infinity in perfect form. And so Jagannath is deliberately imperfect. And Kali, let's face it, is not beautiful. <laughs> there is a, the story of a, um, well, let me explain Kali first. Master explained it, and it's a beautiful symbol, but it's only a symbol. There's a movie of Master's life that a group of people made in India recently. It's a nice, brave attempt, but it really sounds as if they were reading the, foot, the, the uh, uh, subtitles as they were speaking. You know, sort of hesitantly, and then they speak. And anyway, um, in that image, they have that image as masters when master sees the divine mother. That's not what he sees when he sees divine mother. That's not what you see there. It's a reminder of that. So Kali is black, because black represents the night of infinity of space. She has four arms to indicate all different kinds of movement. One is creation, one is preservation, another is destruction, and then another hand is extended out in the blessing of salvation to those who seek it from her. Then she wears a garland of skulls. That doesn't seem very auspicious, <laughs> but in fact these skulls represent, first of all, the fact that all life is temporary but that she is in all minds. 
and she wears the garland of all our consciousness. And her hair is sprayed out like a harridan, but all it means is that she is, her consciousness is omnipresent, her energy, hair represents energy, and energy going out to, to all space. You know, it's interesting. There are two ways that yogis keep their hair. One is to let it grow long, and the other is to shave it. And uh, in letting it grow long, you draw more energy to the brain. In shaving it, you cut out all contact with the world around you to find your energy from within. Both ways are valid. Master and Sri Yukteswar wore their hair long. I used to wear my hair long. Finally, it became a little ridiculous. <laughs> I know I was in Italy once and I spoke about me, me capelli, my hairs, and the, uh, we say hair, single. Il mio capello, I said. They said, no, in Italian it's capelli, hairs. I said, well, in my case, you could say capello. <laughs> 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 but uh, then the, you've got her husband, Shiva, is stretched on the ground. And um, you think, well, has he conquered him or something? Is she such a nag that he's finally... <laughs> Master, Master said that women are weaker than men, but a woman with a six-inch tongue can kill a man six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, but the truth of it is, the truth of it is that, that Shiva is prostrate because he's vibrationless. This aspect of Shiva is Brahman, beyond creation. And then she's got her foot on his breast and she's got her tongue hanging out. And it looks like bloodlust, doesn't it? But it doesn't mean that. It means that she's the dance of creation. And when she puts her foot on, on the infinite, suddenly she comes still. And her tongue is out because when you make a mistake, you say, uh, you bite your tongue, don't you? You're, it's a very common gesture, at least in India. And I think here too. Uh-oh. That kind of thing. That's all it means. It doesn't mean bloodlust. So the image is not very attractive. But when people see her, it's very different. There is a beautiful saint in the 18th century in India, in Bengal. Uh, his name was Ram Prashand, and he was playing, he was working on fixing his fence, and his daughter came and played with him, and he was singing as he was doing it. She said, Daddy, who are you singing to? And he said, I'm singing to my divine mother, but she's very naughty. She won't come to me. She never listens to me. And the daughter said, well, if she never listens, why do you bother calling to her? And she ran, she laughed and ran away. <laughs> and when Ram Prashad came in, he talked to his wife and told her how um, their daughter had come and played with them. And she said, well, no, Dad, no, dear, that's not possible. She's on the other side of town today. So when the daughter came back that evening, he said to her, weren't you playing with me in the fence there? No, Daddy, you can ask anyone. I was not there. I was on the other side of town. <laughs> and then he realized it was the Divine Mother who had come and played with him in this way. And it's such a sweet thing to think that God can play with you. God is very human with you. He is what you want him to be. And when you talk to him, have that feeling of uh, that you can talk openly. Don't hide anything from her. To feel that there's infinity in her face, in her eyes, but share everything with her. And this sharing is a very important point. When you receive, for example, a blessed gift, you sort of take it into yourself, don't you? You want to draw the blessings and feel filled by those blessings. Well, that's not enough. Then you have to share those blessings with God especially. So anything that, uh, any thought that you have, share it with the Divine Mother. Say that this is yours too. I want you, everything I have, I want to give to you. 
But the thought is, if you make a mistake, then do you share that too? Do you share your sins with her? Absolutely you should. Share everything wrong that you've done. Say, it's not mine, it's yours. You know, the definition of yoga is yoga chitavriti nirodha. Yoga is the neutralization of the vortices of feeling. Vivekananda said the, the, uh, uh, it's the stilling of the waves of mind stuff. It isn't stilling, they aren't waves. Vritti is a whirlpool. And you must get rid of that by dissolving those vrittis. Well, what is a vritti? It's something that draws into itself. That means that every vritti tries to draw energy to itself. The best way to dissolve it is to accept it. Don't reject it. Vritti itself implies self, implies self-absorption. A little part of your brain, a little part of your consciousness is held apart. You've had this desire, you've created this little vortex. How do you get rid of it? Well, one way, as I've suggested before, is at night to build a bonfire and throw into that bonfire every attachment, every desire. This is good in the beginning because it separates you from it. But in the end, you have to see that it's all one. And so the best thing is to absorb into yourself and then don't keep for yourself. Then offer it up to God. So if you have had, um, if, if you have had desire, let us say, to become a millionaire, don't say, no, I won't have that desire, because it's still there in your subconscious. You can, allay, you can separate yourself from it in order to free yourself to think of God. But another way is to say, all right, I have all that money. I have it. I don't need to go out and get it. And then I offer it back to God. And in offering it to her, you find yourself freed. But you will notice in this practice in meditation that when you keep anything separate from her, there's a little bit of separation between you and her. You must give that self to her. If you've made a mistake, if, you, if you're aware of a desire, if there's a little bit of ego hurt, anything, whatever insults you receive, absorb them. Don't try to refuse them. Don't try to reject them. Say, all right. I take it into myself, the way people have treated me, the way life has treated me, the way tragedies have come into my life. Don't push them away. That's a little vortex, a little vritti. Just, I give it back. I take it into myself. I absorb it. And that is what I give to you. And then you will find yourself giving all that you are to her. You'll find a wonderful feeling of bliss here the more you do that. So think of sharing yourself on every level with her. Any pain, any desire, any attachment. The same thing is true with the different aspects of God. God is light, sound, wisdom, love, joy, bliss, energy, calmness, etc. But let's just think of one example because a very strong and very satisfying one is Om, the sound of Om. We are taught to listen in the right ear. It's an interesting fact that there is a portion in the brain just above the right ear, and if they stimulate it electrically, you'll have certain spiritual experiences. So you begin with the right ear, and then you absorb yourself in it, but try to bring it over to the left ear and try to become absorbed in that sound until you actually feel your whole body vibrating with that sound. And then when you become absorbed completely in Om, then offer that into the infinite and you'll find that Om vibration going out and being, becoming absorbed in the infinite and it becomes Om Samadhi. And then from that samadhi of Om, then you go further into higher kinds of oneness. So um, another thing import very important is to have the right attitude when 
you meditate. Don't meditate lugubriously. <laughs> meditate with happiness. Meditate with joy if you want to attain bliss. And the more you do that, the more you will find that uh, everything you do is blissful. One time, I, when I came to Master, I was much too intellectual. I found God through my intellect. And fortunately, because of being completely truthful, I always used my intellect in the right way, and it led me to him. But Master told me that what you need is devotion. Without devotion, Sri Yukteswar said, you can't place one foot in front of the other. And uh, at the end of his book, The Holy Science, he says something like, I trust I have proved that love is the uh, most important thing. It's a little funny <laughs> proving this. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the feeling of, of uh, devotion is very necessary. And I worked very hard and I would chant for hours at a time, and I began to feel love, and I began to feel a certain self-satisfaction that finally I've attained this devotion. And Master looked at me one day. He said, if you love yourself, how can you love God? Very interesting answer. If you love yourself, don't be satisfied with yourself for anything. Give that self-satisfaction too. Give it to God. If you can do that, you'll find that that thought of God, that thought of sharing with Him, that thought of Divine Mother being always there, that every thought that you share, you share with her, every thought that you have, and you will find that then she becomes a living presence in your life, and it's very beautiful. So, that's all I have to say to you. <laughs> I had a, 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 a idea came to me of a perfect parody of the absurdity of belief. And forgive me if I finish with this, because <laughs> it's a, this is a song, I believe. <laughs> I believe each time a fairy blows its wee nose, another star is born, <laughs> and, and so do I. <laughs>